Hello everyone, my name is Gerard Dragon Rider Khalil, but most of you at home know me as the Completionist, and welcome back to part 3 of Final Fantasy 7 Month. This analytical experiment has been going very well so far, and now it's time to start with our analysis of Disc 2. Today will be a little bit different as we not only further our journey of the plot, but we also explore the presentation and the gameplay of the game as well. Our guest from last week will also be making more appearances throughout this video as well, so sit back, relax, and let's continue our journey into Disc 2. Oh man, Gerard, I don't know if I'm ready. This is like ten times worse than watching Atreyu's horse sink into the swamp. Can we take a break? Actually, Greg, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. It... it doesn't? Not at all. In a game that's so cinematic, what better time to take a step back and look at why it's so effective than right after the most emotional moment in the game. I could probably remember every single pre-rendered background in that game. Just because like, it was always like a weird camera angle, and it was always like this weird setting, and it didn't feel like towns felt in like uh, Super Nintendo, Final Fantasies, or any other uh, RPGs at the time, because they were like very structured, but like, it was like this, it was just like this drawn world. Um, like a designer made the world. There were many other RPGs that looked beautiful, but didn't have a good story. And the other popular games at the time, the really big games that were out then, weren't story games. They were games that were shooters, racing games, fighting games, but there wasn't anything RPG that was that good. I, I have to admit, like that was when I have to analyze like what was my least favorite part of the game. That was probably it, it was just the, the jarring kind of blockiness of the graphics. I wasn't used to kind of the PlayStation's version of three-dimensional graphics. Um, and so coming at it from the PS2, where everything was like super polished and just like that next step up, kind of taking that graphical downgrade and seeing like, you know, blocky Cloud walking around with his like huge like black gloved arms. Being in whatever grade I was in at the time, I fully am aware that that captured the attention of a lot of people. It wasn't just gamers or, or nerds, it was everyone saw it on TV and saw it in magazines and was like, this is something we've never seen, this is the next generation. This is, that's what we expected for every generation of video game consoles. And so far I've been horribly let down. I mean, a lot of JRPGs that were coming out around that time were still similar to SNES games, right? In graphics wise, in the way they were played, story wise, they were kind of, Final Fantasy VII was shoved into the next gen. And it was the first JRPG that really hit that next gen after like, you know, the SNES era. It was the first one that really captivated people on the PlayStation. And I don't know, I don't know why it stands out, but it had that wow factor, it was good. Final Fantasy VII's genre-defining cinematic feel was a huge undertaking both financially and artistically, requiring the work of about 120 people and a budget of over 30 million dollars. 30 million dollars? In the early 90s? This game cost more to make than Mrs. Doubtfire. Who was working on this game, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates combined? Still Jates! Not quite, but Final Fantasy VII is a living world, and it takes a lot of effort to make that happen. I mean, just look at the game. Every last element is timeless. The character design in this game was the Final Fantasy debut of lead character designer Tetsuya Nomura, who was handpicked by Hironobu Sakaguchi himself when franchise regular Yoshitaka Amano was unable to make the time commitment. Nomura's character designs are also amazing because when he started working on them, the story hadn't even been written yet, so the details he created in his head as he designed everybody actually influenced the course of the story. For example, 
Red 13 only looks the way he does because Nomura wanted a four-legged party member in the game, and his name just comes from the fact that he thought a color and a number together sounded cool. That's crazy! Even 15 years ago, the mainstream video game industry was so much more punk rock than it is now. Maybe that's where Final Fantasy VII's hard edge comes from. Gaia's a tough place to live in. It reminds me of Star Wars or something where the world feels really lived in, and the line between high fantasy and science fiction is blurred. It's like Final Fantasy VI, but even more so. And the fact that the characters were 3D models made them so much more expressive than the static sprites and text boxes of games past. It was because of the design team's desire to create something that felt real and dramatic that the art style of the game evolved this way. Early on, there was talk of doing more detailed pixel art on 3D backgrounds like in Xenogears, but the fact that the characters could move all their body parts made it possible for them to act a little more. I don't think people realize what a huge step forward this was for RPGs as a whole. It changed everything. It breathed life into a game traditionally based around menus. I love that push and pull between art and technology. Final Fantasy VII is such a great example of it. Take the FMV cutscenes. The new technology of CDs made it possible to have these awesome clips highlight and add dynamics to the more important parts of the plot. But since they looked so good, the design team turned towards pre-rendered 3D backgrounds instead of the pixel art grids of games past, so that the discrepancy between the two styles wasn't too jarring. And it really worked! In fact, the only thing they weren't satisfied with was the different style of the character models used in and out of battle. That's why the weird, blocky versions don't exist from Final Fantasy VIII and on! That's also why Nobuo Umatsu's always excellent compositions take a step forward this time around. Many of the songs are longer and more complex because of the increased storage capacity of the disc, and One Winged Angel, perhaps the most famous piece of music in the game, is the first in the series to use recorded vocals. The game orchestrates itself just like a film would, telling you what to feel, when to feel, and how to feel. It leaves the game feeling bigger. Gaia feels like a living world, and that the story we see is just one of many being played out all over it. The game feels so rich and so full that sometimes you get paranoid that you're missing something even after talking to everyone and seeing everything the game has to offer. Final Fantasy VII is like a novel told in video game form, and by the time it was released, Squaresoft was good enough at making games that the last few in the series already felt like intricate and beautiful clockwork. Final Fantasy VII is a standing piece of art that you can truly interact with while using all your senses. You can come back to it at different times in your life and take something new away from it each time. It plays just as good as it looks. I think like one of the other things this game did was like pull in a lot of, like if you got tired of the storyline, there was a lot you could do. Like chocobo breeding and chocobo racing. I must have spent hundreds of hours breeding and racing chocobos and the gold saucer and there's loads of these, you can just explore this expansive world and find like side quests and you know like hidden items and caves. There was so much to do besides the main storyline as well. In terms of like, like becoming mature and like having a more, I don't know, I don't want to say sophisticated, but like at least a more specific view of video games, uh, I still think that game had it right. My least favorite thing about Final Fantasy VII, without a doubt, has to be one of the things that Final Fantasy used to do back in the day, which was you had to grind magic. And so, it, in order to get all your characters prepared so you could have them in whatever situation you needed them, you had to go back and just grind and grind and grind and get them new spells, and get them to learn new things. And since then they've changed that, but they've added other grindy things, which I'd rather grind for magic, knowing that I'm improving my character, than like cards or chocobo babies. That was a banner year. If, if not like one of the pinnacle years of gaming, you have the N64 entering into like this huge heyday all of a sudden with, with GoldenEye and Mario Kart and Diddy Kong Racing. Um, you know, and, and just, you have uh, Ocarina of Time on the way. Uh, and then you have all these awesome, like, Mega Man Legends, and, and, you know, looking at this list, like, you have Diablo and stuff. And then, 
as like the, the crowning achievement almost, the, the one that supersedes all these phenomenal games, Star Fox 64, another one, you know, Gran Turismo, all these franchises that live on to this day and, and were, you know, the best of their franchise, you have Final Fantasy VII as the thing that got past all these other amazing gold games and just rose even higher. The gameplay of Final Fantasy VII is so universally loved because it strikes the perfect balance between the traditional ATV-based combat of the SNES days and a more modern and gameable leveling system. Tack on a few nuggets of genre-defining innovation, and boom, we got a new RPG. So first, let's talk about Materia for a second. Rather than gaining new skills and abilities simply by gaining experience, the Materia system creates a much more open-ended and customizable system by attributing your party's learnable moves to small Mako-based powered orbs that grow in power the more you use them. They can be combined together in various ways. At the end of each battle, you gain experience points which increase your level, and AP points which increase the level of each individual Materia equipped. This is how you evolve your party. For example, if you have a fire materia, with the base spell being fire, you can level it up and now you can cast fire in fire too. And through hard work and grinding, you can master the materia, which will unlock the highest amount of damage from that materia. And when you master the materia, you also get another one for free. And there's all different kinds of materia. Red materia is summon based, in which you can summon monsters, gods, goddesses alike to fight on your behalf. For those of you new to Final Fantasy, summons are a common trope in these games. Green Materia is usually your offensive magic. Blue Materia is your support slash all materia, where you can cast spells on multiple enemies if the materia are tied together. Purple is general battle support, materia that affects your party stats. And yellow is battle command materia, where the materia adds another command to your battle actions. This gets crazy big and crazy cool when you start getting things like four cut, mug, or my favorite, mimic. Wait. But if Materia comes from Mako, and Mako is the distilled version of the livestream, and if Gaia's currently in trouble because they're depleting the livestream, then... Oh god, Gerard, doesn't that mean that- Precisely, Greg. The reason we still talk about Final Fantasy VII's gameplay today is that not only was it fun, but elements of it also forced the player to interact with the game's core themes, whether they were totally conscious of it or not. For example, Materia is based on taking from the planet, but it's also how your characters are able to grow. It's a conflict of interest, and it perfectly exemplifies why experiencing loss isn't always as simple as it seems. Though that still doesn't explain why maxing out the enemy skill Materia is so damn annoying. Sin goes for limit breaks. Sure, there were awesome new attacks you got to unleash when you piled up enough damage, and it was really cool to be able to hold on to them until the next big boss fight, but they also sort of help exemplify each of the characters' identifying traits. There's four different tiers of limit breaks, and you unlock two limit breaks per tier. To unlock the second limit break, you need to use the first limit break a certain number of times. To unlock a new tier of limit breaks, you need to kill a certain number of enemies with that character. It's very possible early on to get all your character's limit breaks. Plus, the whole system is based around each character getting more and more angry the more they're attacked. So when the limit break is finally unleashed, what we get to see is an expression of that specific character's innermost turmoil. That's why Cloud channels anger through Zack's old sword, why Aerith amplifies her compassion for others, why Red 13 howls into the night, and so on. It's an expression of their damaged identity. And what about when Tifa and Sid take over the party? How much more literal of an identity crisis can you have? It's also great to just travel around and explore the world. Whether you're in the buggy, a chocobo, the submarine, the tiny bronco, the high wind, or even just on foot, there's always something new and neat to do. It makes the world feel bigger, the story feel bigger, and in turn the game feels bigger. Final Fantasy VII's gameplay creates an entire world. It's a feeling that many gamers at the time were probably feeling for the first time, and it still hasn't stopped being wonderful. Gameplay considered, Final Fantasy VII becomes a truly complete story told from every conceivable angle. Man, that was great. Okay, Shirako, I'm ready to get back to the plot now. Alright, Greg, but brace yourself. Cloud's uphill climb is about to begin. Loss will soon make way for coping. 
After Aerith's death, the party follows the Sephiroth clones and Genova north to the Icicle Inn, where they discover the details of Aerith's parents. Unfortunately, they also run into some Turks who are mad at Cloud for critically injuring their boss when he shrank the Temple of the Ancients. But, hilariously enough, Cloud just snowboards away off a mountain and onto the Great Glacier. <laughs> That is one of the coolest things that has ever happened in a video game. Forget walking away from explosions in slow motion, how about snowboarding away from all conflict and onto a nearby glacier? Choice. Anyway, they make their way through the mountains until they arrive at the Northern Crater, the real Sephiroth's resting place, where the reunion is well underway. The black hooded figures are revealed to be pieces of Genova, and Sephiroth is controlling and absorbing all of them via Genova. He is building his power until he can cast Meteor and destroy the entire world. All Sephiroth needs? The Black Materia. Cloud and company arrive and challenge Genova slash Sephiroth to a fight. They defeat them and grab the Black Materia. Cloud, Tifa, and one other party member decide to go down and finish off Sephiroth once and for all. But Cloud does not trust himself with the Black Materia, so he leaves it with one party member of your choice and the rest of the party. While there, Sephiroth shows them a vision revealing that Cloud isn't who he thinks he is. Sephiroth calls into question whether or not Cloud's just been Genova's pawn this whole time because of Hojo's treatments. Now this is where Cloud hits his peak of identity. He's being made a fool no matter what he does or says. However, the truth is in plain sight. Zack was the true hero that accompanied Sephiroth to Nibelheim, not Cloud. Suddenly, Rufus, Hojo, and Scarlet, the head of Shinra's weapons development branch, all appear at the cave in the airship Highwind, having discovered the location of the ancient Cetra Kaiju weapons inside. Within all of this confrontation, Sephiroth controls Cloud like a puppet again and convinces Cloud out of his mind with self-doubt to summon the party member you gave the materia to to give it to Cloud. Cloud then flies above to where Sephiroth is sealed and places the black materia into the Mako deposit. This is when we're starting to like learn that Cloud isn't what Cloud thinks he is. We're starting to learn with Cloud that he is not who he thinks he is. And this is when everything starts to come undone and you realize that like, this guy who you have been playing as the hero is real messed up. He is a messed up dude and he doesn't know who he is or what he is. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I was thought was going to happen. In this exchange, all hell breaks loose. Sephiroth, Black Materia in hand, immediately casts Meteor. The weapons awaken, everybody leaves the crater on the high wind, and Sephiroth puts a barrier around the crater so no one else can get in. Cloud goes tumbling into the live stream and. Hey, I thought you said it was an uphill battle from here. All I'm seeing is more loss and the worst identity crisis so far. There's no battle, it's just getting worse. Maybe so, but the first step to healing is admitting that you have a problem. And boy oh boy, did Cloud ever do that. Tifa and Barrett wake up a week later in custody at Junon, and the world has gone crazy. There's a meteor in the sky, and Rufus has decided to execute them as scapegoats for the coming apocalypse. Sid and the others hijack the high wind and save Barrett, but just as Tifa is about to be killed, a giant weapon shows up and attacks the city. Shinra's Mako cannon destroys the monster, but Tifa escapes to the high wind and they fly out in the mass confusion. Cloud is nowhere to be found, so the party heads off to try and find him with Tifa in the lead. Here. Final Fantasy VII gives us yet another storytelling device that only a video game can convey. By placing the player in control of Tifa, the game gives them an active way to experience a lack of faith in Cloud as a leader. By forcing them to look through Tifa's eyes for a while, the game is asking them if they're sure they still want to be Cloud. And now that you have control of the Highwind, it's time to scope out areas you've never been to before. And there's not too many. The team eventually finds Cloud, sick with Mako poisoning, in a town called Medeal. And to throw an even larger wrench into the identity issues machine, now Tifa elects to stay behind with Cloud as he heals. The group as a whole has a hard time understanding if Cloud is actually Cloud, or if he's just another Sephiroth clone. The crew then has to nominate someone to lead them, and the person they choose is Sid. When he gets back on the airship, Ketchi, sorry we pronounced it wrong last week, reveals Shinra's plan to use a special type of materia called huge materia as a devastating weapon. They decide they must find all four pieces and stop them at all costs. So let's just do a mini recap thus far, all right? We got the real Sephiroth, now free from his Makwa deposit prison, and he summoned Meteor. 
Shinra is trying to destroy Meteor while trying to stop the group from stopping the Meteor, Shinra and Sephiroth. Cloud and Tifa are no longer with us. Aerith is dead. And to top it all off, there are huge monsters designed to destroy the planet, and they're trying to kill everyone. Damn! Back in his element, Sid takes over as Captain of the Highwind and begins the hunt for the huge materia. While he may not be the hero, he is a great leader, and now that everyone knows exactly what they have to do to save the day, Optimism returns, and the healing process now begins. The first huge materia is located in North Corel, and when they hijack the train that's holding it, they have to save it from crashing into the city. It may not seem like much more than a cool action sequence at first, but looking at it another way, it's also the first step in Barrett's healing process, and now that he's a hero, he doesn't have to feel so ashamed showing his face in his hometown anymore. This theme continues in the quest for the second huge materia at the place called Fort Condor. Now, a lot of you voiced your concern that we skipped the battle of Fort Condor in the main plot of the first disc, as you can visit Fort Condor between our journey from Calm to Junon Harbor. The reality is, it's not that important to the current plight of our heroes in disc 1. But in Disc 2, it's a whole new ballgame. Shinra runs a reactor at Fort Condor, but when the party arrives, they find the company in an armed conflict with the indigenous folk over a sacred condor nesting at the top of the fort. Shinra perceives it as a threat to their operations and wants it destroyed, but the inhabitants won't allow it. It's a perfect metaphor for the way Gaia is finally starting to shake off Shinra's evil influence. When Avalanche and company arrives, they're able to defeat the Shinra troops and grab the huge materia, but more importantly to our overarching theme, even even though the sacred condor dies in the battle, a brand new baby condor hatches in the nest, which symbolizes new hope and rebirth. How sweet. I love that the game feels super positive now. Maybe Sakaguchi's idea of moving on is actually taking hold. Speaking of which, at this point, Sid suggests the party go back and check on Cloud in Medeal. But once they get there, they're immediately attacked by a weapon monster known as the Ultimate Weapon. Your party is able to defeat it for now, but not before it is able to critically damage the town, causing the livestream to explode from the ground into the air. In this motion, the livestream takes Tifa and Cloud with a large portion of the village. Tifa and Cloud go on a journey through Cloud's subconscious, where she's able to help him realize what actually happened in Nibelheim between him, Sephiroth, and Zack. This is probably the moment in the game where it is crystal clear that our theme of identity and loss hits at its hardest. We walk with Tifa as she goes on her journey to find her real friend since they were kids. Her eyes immediately open as to who he is. She cradles Cloud in these moments, giving him the assurance that it's time for him to come home to his family and save the world. For Cloud, Zack is the hero, but Tifa makes it clear that Cloud has always been her hero, and he's been saving Tifa for his entire life. For the first time since the game has begun, Cloud Strife knows exactly who he is, and he immediately snaps out of his coma. Cloud Strife, the real Cloud Strife, has finally joined our party. All together again with new resolve and acceptance for their past traumas, Avalanche heads to Junon Harbor for the third huge materia. Yay! Cloud's himself again. It's amazing how much confidence you can gain from admitting your problems to yourself and actually trying to work on them. It's like the final step of the five stages of grief we talked about in the Majora's Mask episode. Go kick some fanny, Cloud! Cloud almost got dragged along by the people he was with. And I feel like if, if this had been a game where it was just Cloud, we would have lost him very early on. So there was the element of like his friends around him helped him through, but also the element of like he felt, so he experienced a lot of very human emotions, right? That we don't normally see in like a superhero, like Link, for example, in Zelda. Like he wouldn't feel guilt. Like we get this really strong feeling of guilt from Cloud and he feels responsible for the death of Eris. And we get this feeling of like revenge. We get this feeling of like hopelessness. The best thing about Final Fantasy VII is that they didn't ever play it safe. I think it's really funny that if you go to the Golden Saucer, you can have the option to go on a date with Barrett. If you uh, are in Midgar early in the game, you rescue the girls dressed as a girl. Right? It doesn't. It doesn't pull punches. It's very silly and fun, and it's okay with that. Because it was kind of like this dark world, like there wasn't really much happiness in that world, right? Like everybody was kind of 
sad and like a bunch of like terrible shit was going on all the time. Um, so like it, it gave this sense of like loneliness and like helplessness and then like the feeling of like corporation strength was really big. If there's one thing that Final Fantasy really excels in, it's its relationships, uh, which is fundamental to telling a good story, right? Like that is the essence of drama, of comedy, is, is relationships between people, or in this case, characters. And, you know, Cloud's relationship with Tifa, Cloud's relationship with Aerith, Cloud's relationship with Barrett, like, and, and how, you know, Aerith and Tifa kind of having like a girl fight, you know, there's so many interesting, interesting relationships in that game that that's truly where Final Fantasy VII excels. With Cloud at the helm, the party heads underwater to take the third huge materia from the Turks in Junon Harbor before heading back to Rocket Town on the trail of the fourth and final huge materia. Shinra is planning to launch the huge materia into space using Sid's old rocket as a last ditch effort to destroy the meteor. Now this is where Sid finally gets his own redemption. If they're going to launch the rocket, he is going to be a part of it in some form of another. They get into the cockpit to try and abort the launch, but it's too late, and Sid decides to try and finally fulfill his dream of going into space, even if it's not exactly the way that he imagined. Shira is also on board, and when the oxygen tank that she was inspecting all those years ago finally explodes, it pins Sid to the ground. He realizes there was really no way that he would have made it out the first time he tried. It gives him his closure. He's finally able to forgive Shira. They get away with the huge materia in an escape pod, but in this moment, Sid experiences one last moment of loss as he sees his dream in the form of a rocket ship run straight into the meteor and explode. And with all of Sephiroth's magical powers, the meteor rebuilds itself. Confused and defeated, the party now heads over to Cosmo Canyon to see if Bugenhagen has any leads on saving the world. Luckily, he does! He stores the huge materia in his lab, by the way, remember this for next week's episode, and takes them to the forgotten capital where he discovers that the seemingly useless white materia Aerith carried with her all those years back actually contained Holy and that she summoned it shortly before her death. They find out it actually has the power to stop the meteor, but that Sephiroth's power is holding it back. That leaves them with only one option, to destroy Sephiroth. Well, not so fast. As you start to leave, Ketchy reveals that- Are you serious? How many times is Ketchy gonna tell you something super serious just after you do something awesome? Right? Anyways, he reveals that he's being controlled by Reeve back at Shinra headquarters. In case you don't remember, Reeve was the one who opposed the idea of crushing Sector 7 with the plate. Reeve heard that they're moving the cannon from Junon to Midgar to use its Mako reserves to fire a blast at Sephiroth at the North Crater. How's that for Weird Identity Crisis? Why would this guy choose a magical demonic cat that rides a Moogle as his avatar? Cloud and friends fly to Midgar to stop the cannon, but when they get there, they are met by the diamond weapon. They're able to stagger it, but unluckily for them, it just gives Shinra enough time to fire and destroy both the weapon and Sephiroth's shield. Still, before it dies, the diamond weapon is able to destroy much of Midgar, and Rufus is killed in his office. However, before the High Wind's able to get to the crater, Ketchi pipes up again and tells everyone that Hojo is powering up the cannon for one last shot at the crater. He also says that it'll probably explode and kill everyone in Midgar if it's fired again. They make their way through the Turks and one of Scarlet's monster creations before finding- Oh God! Is that Hojo? Yeah, that's Hojo. He finally reveals that he's Sephiroth's father and that this whole messed up situation is the direct result of his experiments. He wants to use the cannon to send Sephiroth one last boost of energy. And when Cloud tries to stop him, we discover Hojo has been injecting himself with Genova cells and that we've got a pretty gnarly fight ahead of us. The party defeats all of his weird mutant forms. It's like everyone transforms in this game. It's like, it's, it's like it's almost the theme of the game! In these last moments, Cloud gives the party an ultimatum. Everyone can spend their final moments on Gaia with their family and friends, and just forget about the whole fight with Sephiroth. 
or they can join with Cloud and Tifa as they plan their attack against Sephiroth, Genova, and everything else that stands in their way at the North Crater. This is a wonderful moment where Cloud and Tifa realize that the only family they have is each other, and they spend their last free day on Gaia in the High Wind together. The next day, everyone shows up to let Cloud and Tifa know that they're seeing this through till the end. Everyone is healing if not completely happy, and all that lies ahead is the final showdown with Sephiroth. End of Disc 2. So if all that's left is the final showdown, where does that leave our thematic arcs of loss and identity? Happily, we leave them today on a positive note. As we saw today, it seems that the ultimate message of Final Fantasy VII is that with good friends to help you, no matter what you've lost or how confused you may be, you'll always find your way home. But is that too easy? Are we focusing too much on the surface meaning? How much deeper can we get? The answer is plenty, and you can find out exactly how much in next week's finale, where we talk about the game as a whole, all the fun and crazy stuff there is to do on the side, including end game discussions of completionist quests, and get you ready for delving into the rest of the games in the series. The game thus far has taught us how to overcome loss and reinvent hope within one another and ourselves. So I invite you all to come back next week and join us as we close the final chapter in our journey through Final Fantasy VII.